And again, we have a lot going on this morning. In just about an hour or so, we'll be joined by uh, Suzanne Hawkins. She's a member, of course, of the uh, the City Council in Twin Falls. And will spend a few minutes with us talking about some issues that are taking place. And if you're living in Twin Falls or you shop in Twin Falls or you drive through Twin Falls, this may be very important to you. She'll be handling some of your questions as well, I'm sure. Also, a couple of other things. If you have not yet looked at our website, we have additional video, new video taken by our good friend Brad of the uh, the Chinese rocket, which is the explanation for that large glow in the sky the other night. Interestingly enough, uh, people out uh, out throughout the, uh, the the Mountain West claim to have seen it all the way down as far south as parts of Arizona and up north into Canada. But over the weekend, there was a similar type of flash in the sky over western New York State. A minor newspaper called the Olean Times Herald reported the story. I know this because I used to deliver that newspaper when I was a little boy, and I occasionally take a peek at its website. So they had a very similar occurrence on the other side of the continent. Maybe the Chinese are at war with us, and we just don't know it. Look for an explanation. Now, all of those things out of the way today. We have, perhaps, I'm waiting for confirmation. And I hate to do this without getting a call back from someone who may be involved, but I did leave two messages this morning. There is an elementary school just a few feet down the street from where we broadcast. It is called Oregon Trail Elementary School. Beautiful building, I should note. Uh, Beautiful building, beautiful grounds, and we pass by it often coming to and from work. All I can tell you is it seems to be a picture-perfect place where you would want to send your children to school. Yesterday, a fellow who wanted to remain anonymous telephoned us here at our radio stations, News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com, of course, being among those groupings. We should point out that the, the dot com means you can hear us anywhere around the world, anytime that you like. And we would hope you would check us out if you're on the road somewhere and you're not necessarily within range of our broadcast signal. Here's the thing. It's difficult to go out and and talk about this unless we have some sort of confirmation. But he swore, and and I don't have any reason to, to object to what he had to say, but he made a claim that yesterday during the public address announcements, you know, you remember these when you were kids, we'd get into school when I was in grade school. We had a principal named Mr. Boyd. And Mr. Boyd would come on the public address system. He would do the announcements for the day, which were fairly brief. And then we would all be led through him in the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. And when that would finish, he would flip off the microphone, and then our teachers would lead us in singing uh, singing a song, My Country Tis of It, usually. And then we would get on with our, with our class day. This fellow says that yesterday, the principal at Oregon Trail Elementary School was reading verses from the Koran during the course of morning announcements. Now... <sighs> The knee-jerk response is to say, what's next? Are they going to have the children out back practicing chopping off heads or burning people or crucifying people? And, you know, that may be over the top. We don't want to go quite that far. Yet, I'm sure they do not read from the Torah. I am sure they do not read from the Christian Bible. If they did, you'd be hearing from the ACLU, right? I mean, it it wouldn't be long before that group came in and started screaming and yelling that somebody might actually hear a biblical phrase, roll over on the floor in a grand mal seizure, and good golly, we couldn't have that. Some people would say that's driving out demons. But if indeed they're reading from a Koran to elementary school students, then I think perhaps some parents out there should be a little concerned, especially if the parents, and again, this is just hearsay we're, we're, we're dealing with. You would, you would expect that a parent would have foreknowledge of something like this before it would happen. But we are in quite a pickle in this country because we have so many politically correct folks who are trying to tell us how we should see the world that a lot of us are cowed into silence when we are alarmed by some of the things that are happening, especially with our own children. And I saw something related today. This comes from a fellow who writes for the National Review. His name is Andrew McCarthy. And he writes, it doesn't matter one bit what Barack Obama thinks true Islam is. And this is the problem in this country. We, we, we just simply are paralyzed when it comes to addressing some of the real issues that we happen to be dealing with on an everyday basis. And I'm going to jump down here. He's referring to the summit that the president had. What was it, last week where they gathered some 
various members of the Islamic community across the country. There were some omissions in there, too, that were somewhat curious, but he gathered them for a conference that lasted three days. And then everyone came out, held hands, made nice, blew kisses at each other, and said, problem solved! Yeah. The summit, Mr. McCarthy writes, and he's a former federal prosecutor, so he's, he's not coming at this as just some guy who's cranky old man. The summit, he writes, had little to do with confronting terrorism that the president did not invite. The FBI director did not get an invitation. You get that? That would be a guy who is in charge of fighting domestic crime in this country. Did not get an invitation to the terrorism summit. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. It wasn't called terrorism summit, was it? It was called the summit on, it's really a police peaceful religion. Just believe that whatever I tell you. The summit was really about, McCarthy writes, advancing the social justice agenda of progressive politics. In his summit speech, Obama made the concession, and I'm getting something, getting to a point here where I'm going to relate this to what may have happened down the street yesterday. Obama made the concession, which was almost shocking coming from him, that ISIS and al-Qaeda terrorists do draw from Islamic texts. He mocked them, however, for doing so selectively. Okay. Well, you know, people say that about the Bible, too. You can, you can sometimes... You take a couple of passages out of Leviticus that might be similar to what you see happening uh, in the Islamic world right now with ISIS. Uh, people here would say, oh, that's out of context. Although, according to Leviticus, it, these were the orders of God handed down to people like Moses. And then later on, Aaron. But you're not supposed to talk about that sort of thing. That can get you in trouble in this country. Mr. McCarthy says, but then almost in the next breath, the president engaged in the same a bolderizing of Islamic teaching of which he had just accused our enemies. We should, he said, be listening to, instead of the terrorists, quote, Muslim clerics and scholars, unquote, <laughs> who, quote, push back on this twisted interpretation, unquote, and assure us, quote, that the Quran says whoever kills an innocent, it is this, as if he has killed all mankind, unquote. And then the president stopped. Did you know why he stopped? Well... This is why I'm a little disturbed if children are being read the Quran in schools without parental permission. Mr. McCarthy says the Quran does indeed say what Obama said in Surah 532. Yet in the very next verse, conveniently omitted by Obama, 533, it goes on to say this. Quote, The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive with might and main for mischief through the, through the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from the opposite sides or exile from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. Unquote. So we don't know if this actually happened at the school. And it, I, as I say, I left a couple of messages. No one has called me back. But my point being, if it indeed happened, what were they reading these children? I sure hope they weren't reading them this particular verse unless they were trying to warn the children of some potential trouble down the road in this country. Mr. Obama, he says, Mr. McCarthy, that is the writer, says, Mr. Obama, when he speaks of Islam, not only takes scripture out of context, he also renders it as if there were a universal understanding of words like innocent. Yet when we read the above two verses and put them in the broader context of Islamic doctrine, we see that Islam can convey a notion of who is an innocent, that is very different from the one we Westerners are likely to have. To be innocent in this context, one must accept Islam and submit to its law. If you don't, ISIS will come to your house if you're an ancient uh, Christian community and drag you away, and likely most of those people already have had their death warrants signed. There was a story also yesterday that I happened to see, and this one is not getting a lot of play. You will not see it at ABC, CBS, NBC, or at CNN, the Communist News Network, or over at MSDNC, it was not reported by the Washington Post, the New York Times, or even the Times News or the Idaho Statesman. But over the last half dozen years, the largest block of immigrants to the United States have not come from Mexico, have not come from Guatemala, have not come from Honduras. The largest block, we are talking in the hundreds of thousands, soon to be approaching millions, are coming from Islamic lands. And they are practicing that faith. And the government is promoting it. Joe Biden has gone so far, in fact, he mentioned it at the summit, that we would be bringing far more of these people to this country. Now, if I were trying to destroy America's traditional 
culture, this is perhaps the route I would go. There was something interesting that I happened to see while I was in the last hour of preparation for the show today where a writer pointed out, and I think this is something we need to understand. When Rudy Giuliani said President Obama was not a patriot, he didn't say President Obama hates America. See, from the left, they say, oh, see, he claims Mr. Obama hates the country. Well, no, there's a difference there. But clearly, he may not love the country the way it has been. And that is why they see a need to change the country to something that he believes, he alone, perhaps, believes is the better approach. He was elected on a bad economy. He was not elected to create a nationalized health care system or some shell of it like he did. He was not elected to turn around and destroy the country with massive immigration and open borders. And he was not elected to destroy our traditional culture, which happens to be a westernized Judeo-Christian culture. He was simply elected because people believed he could better manage the economy at the time than John McCain. He would not have been reelected if media had played it straight in 2012, but instead, of course, they were on his team. And Mitt Romney, no matter what he did, if Romney had fallen over dead, the media would have said he fa he'd fallen the wrong way. You understand exactly how this has worked. So we are waiting for a response from Oregon Trail Elementary School. And I'll tell you what, I'll be as honest as possible. I hope it's not true. And if we hear from them and they say it isn't, I owe them a huge apology for spending so much time on this subject this morning. But indeed, if it is going on, then it does raise the question, when are we going to have readings from the, the Torah and the Christian Bible or the Gita? Uh, if you're going to be doing units for these students on all, the world's religions, that's one thing. And number two, how come the parents would not be informed of this if they had not been? These are serious questions that we have to put forth before these people who are educating your children. And, and it may raise the question, if they are indeed doing this and they're not informing parents, then maybe they're not qualified to be educating your children. A great many people out there take a lot of flack for homeschooling their young ones. Now you know why they do it. Because they don't have to deal with any of these questions. They don't have to deal with someone else who always believes, I know better than you do when it comes to the future of your, your children, and perhaps grandchildren as well. So that out of the way so far this morning. We're waiting on more details on that. A couple of other things I'd like to mention too as well. Oh, Suzanne Hawkins, I mentioned that earlier. She'll be joining us for a few minutes in the next hour of the program, a member of the Twin Falls City Council, and she'll be able to chat with us about some ongoing issues and perhaps even take some of your questions as well. And I have a couple of other points, too, I would like to make, but I have 15 topics on here, and I have 75 minutes to get through them. So we'll see what we can do. Right now, 38 at our studios. Referencing quickly uh, that, that site people saw the other day, and a great many people did see it, that, that blaze across the sky. If you've been wondering exactly what that happened to be, we have some details on our website Newsradio1310.com. Take a look at that if you get an opportunity. And AP has picked up some details about it as well. Major Martin O'Donnell with the U.S. Strategic Command says the lights were a Chinese rocket booster that re-entered the atmosphere and broke apart about 11 o'clock mountain time. Now, one of my co-workers actually saw it earlier. In fact, uh, even before sunset was uh, fully, uh, it was dusk, I guess. So to say that it happened at 11 p.m., uh, this thing must have been trailing through that atmosphere for a very, very long time, or it wasn't alone. Mr. O O'Donnell, or Major O'Donnell, says the rocket that launched a satellite in December wasn't abnormally large, but re-entry angles and weather can make things look brighter. And Mike uh, Henke, with the American Meteor Society, says his organization got more than 150 reports of the event from nine western states and from Canada. So apparently the space junk that the Chinese launch or that they leave behind isn't as, as sturdy as what we have. The last time I can really remember there being so much worry or panic about space junk was when there was a, a ship up in space called Skylab. Now anybody who was younger than the age of 50 would probably not know what I'm talking about. But it was this thing that floated around in space for a while and for public relations reasons, I guess. 
and eventually it tumbled back to earth. And there were so many fears around the world, especially from a lot of people in the third world, that it was going to fall on their heads, uh, that they were, they were calling out the good old USA, uh, blaming us for uh, dropping this. In fact, in India, one man apparently got into a fight with another man after the man called him Skylab. That was about 40 years ago. And it ended up falling into the sea and nothing came about it. But if the Chinese are going to be launching all of these rockets into space and two months later they're going to be falling on our heads, that might be a, perhaps a, a backdoor entry into to war. I, I'm not so sure about that. I just throw that out there. 826, Bill Colley with you this morning. 39 at our studios. This is News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. You can reach our program today by 736 0300. 736 0300. Look, I've got a number of things to talk about. But what I spent the first segment of the program on, I think, is very, very important. And some of you may have children or grandchildren going to that school. And maybe someone came home yesterday from school and shared details with you. I'd love to hear it because I'd like to get to the bottom of this thing and clean it up one way or another. And that is, they are actually reciting Quranic verses in Twin Falls schools. I think that the public should really have some input on all of that. A couple of other things, too, I'd like to talk about before we reach the uh, the 8.30 break, which is coming up rather quickly this morning, I should point out, as I'm looking at my clock. Sometimes I tend to seize on a topic, and the next thing I know, I've, I, to the detriment of so many other things that we could be talking about in the course of a, in the course of a day. Another story that I happen to see that I find a, a bit alarming, and it's much more common, I'm sure, than most people are aware of, in Pocatello, two people have come forward and said they, they had found bank card skimmers at two different ATMs. And it mentions the FBI is now looking at this. But you know what these things do? They can grab your PIN number. They are really uh, they can mimic, and they slide right in, and, and they can mimic the actual uh, the look of an ATM receptacle where you put your card in. Some years ago, and I was telling this story to some people over the weekend at the Home and Garden Show, some years ago, I had been invited to give a speech in New Jersey at an event, women's conference of all things, which was unusual for me. And I had been in, invited, and I had to take a ferry boat to get there. And I needed some money for the ferry boat, so I ran into a gas station. The ATM was actually sponsored by my bank, but I don't think anyone paid a lot of attention to it. Swiped my card, got the cash out, drove down to the ferry dock, paid the guy, got to New Jersey without any serious issues. And then, perhaps a couple of months later, I got a telephone call, and it, it was in conjunction with my bank card being denied one day when I tried to buy breakfast with it at a local diner. I couldn't figure out why. And then I got a telephone call from a state policeman in New York who told me that someone had a copy of my card, and they happened to try to withdraw $4,400 out of my bank account at a casino thinking that, well, people wouldn't notice a big with, uh, withdrawal at a casino. That might be common. But my bank had a computer program. When unusual transactions happened, it would freeze the account. It was a good thing. I'm not you know, complaining about that. The bank was called Key Bank. There's a branch here in Twin Falls. So they actually put a hold on that account. And the trooper told me, he said, you know, I've been doing this long enough, he said, where I do everything I can in cash transactions. He said, I know that people are, are hooked on this online purchasing and using ATMs and swiping debit cards wherever they go. But he said, I find if I use cash, I save myself a lot of headaches. And then a year or two passed, and I didn't think anything of it because I, I did not lose anything. I just had to get a new card issued. But a year or two passed, and I got a telephone call from the same state trooper, and he told me that there was a gang, gang out of Bulgaria, that had been responsible and they'd managed to finally arrest them all. They'd go around and they'd, they'd walk into these uh, convenience stores in some cases right around Christmas time. And the young kids who were working there would be desperate perhaps for Christmas money. And they would say, give me, uh, give me all of your slips and I'll give you a couple hundred dollars. Bingo. Problem right there. We have more coming up. Bill Colley with you. As I mentioned, we have a member of the Twin Falls City Council on the way. It's 38 at 830. I would like to uh, to share with people some details of something we've been telling you about the last couple of weeks. There are a great many people who may be looking for a little secondary income in their families, or people who retired now feel that perhaps they'd like to stay a little bit more active and could pick up a little bit more money. 
We've been telling you about Western States Bus Services, hiring part-time bus drivers right now, split shifts, five days per week. Of course, you get the summers off and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. Apply today. You can telephone 733-8003. That's 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. I have found it in my great big stack of material. I don't say stack of stuff. That ball, I think he's a... I think Rush Limbaugh has actually copyrighted that phrase, and I don't want to get him angry. Uh, He's a very important man in this business. Investors Business Daily. I was mentioning this a little earlier. Now, as you know, uh, once again, the Republican Party, the party without stones, has uh, has caved in on, uh, it looks like, homeland security issues and amnesty, allowing more illegal aliens through uh, through the civ we call a southern border. And they've also decided to cave on net neutrality as well, which tomorrow is uh, going to be foisted upon us, the big government takeover of the Internet. You know, Hillary Clinton was talking about that, favoring the Chinese model as long ago as 1998. So you don't expect if she gets to be president that she'll reverse any of this, do you? And once it's done, how many government decisions and programs ever, once they're done, how often do they ever get turned around? Well, not very often. It's 8.35. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story 39 at our studios. You can reach our program by dialing 736-0300. That's 736-0300. News Radio 1310 KLIX. Also online, newsradio1310.com. You can hear us anywhere around the planet, at least until net neutrality is uh, adopted and then they start cracking down on various shows and programs and websites they don't like. You never know. I mean, this is this is, could be it. This could be the government's first or last big effort to finally encircle us and, uh, and remove all of our last liberties. And if you don't have the internet and suddenly your TV goes dark, how would you know if somebody was uh, trying to pull a fast one on you, if there was some sort of you know major takeover? Uh, it, it, I'm not saying it's going to happen today or tomorrow, but these are all just more nails in the coffin. Investors Business Daily. A writer by the name of Paul Sperry says, Muslim immigration poses a serious national security threat. France, Belgium, and now even liberal Denmark regret, uh, that is regret, letting in so many immigrants from Muslim countries. Their swelling Islamic communities have become breeding grounds for terrorists. So why is the U.S. opening the floodgates to foreign Muslims? The threat Muslim immigrants pose to homeland security was not addressed during the White House's three-day summit. Instead, Vice President Joe Biden, and he was probably groping them at the same time, assured Muslim groups gathered during one session that the wave of Muslim immigration is, quote, not going to stop, unquote. And he says it's not a wave. The writer at the Investor's Business Daily, he says it is more like a tsunami. Between 2010 and 2013, the Obama White House imported almost 300,000 new immigrants from Muslim nations, more immigrants than the U.S. let in from Central America and Mexico combined over that period. Think about that for a moment. What are they up to? What is the end game? What is the battle plan here? What, what are they trying to do to us and to do to, do to this country? Way back in 1965, Ted Kennedy and some other morally uh, bankrupt liberals changed the immigration system at the time, so we had fewer and fewer immigrants from English-speaking countries, or people at least with Western traditions and values. And that was done as well, to try to break down our culture. Don't tell me otherwise. You wouldn't do it unless that was part of the goal. And they knew, of course, too, that they would find lots of Democrats who would be coming here looking for Santa Claus to give them a few things, and that they could continue to win elections in that in that particular vein. Now, This morning, before I actually got on air, I emailed the office of U.S. Senator Mike Crapo, and I said, look, I think what these guys need to do is reconsider this Mitch McConnell as majority leader. And then facetiously, I said, I think what you need is a Republican in charge. I did get a response, and it's from one of the assistants to Senator Crapo, and it says that the senator is getting inundated with people who are also contacting him with the same types of uh, of views. So the public is not happy about this. People even in Idaho are steamed. And I think because of that, what you're seeing, you, 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 you would hope that the members would finally, they had an opportunity not long ago, just last month, 
Republicans had an opportunity to remove Boehner and McConnell, and they did not do it. And they told us, but now we've got these new majorities in both houses of Congress. We are going to turn around, and we are going to give President Obama and the liberals the what for. And yet here we go again. When they run up to the battlefield, then they turn around and they break like the British at the Battle of New Orleans. They ran through the bushes, and I'm telling you, there is not a Republican out there who apparently can be counted upon to actually show a little bit of political courage and to say, no, this has got to stop, at least not in mass. 839, coming up on 840. Bill Colley with you this morning. 40 at our studios. You're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. There may be no end in sight to it. You know, I suppose we're just going to have to learn to live with it, and then someday you'll wonder how you ended up getting caged. I've got more details ahead uh, coming up, too, as well. Keystone Pipeline looks like it's dead. So much for Republican uh, strength there, too, as well. Ah, music to charm a liberal's heart. Isn't that the theme? When they remember when they booed God at the 2012 Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. I think this was the actual theme music for the event. Tell me that they don't need an exorcism. Speaking of a speaking of religious faith, some of you may have heard about this. If not, I think it's uh, it's worthwhile because we have some people in our listening audience who are very devout when it comes to. Uh, their faith, and and they really have gotten sick and tired of people beating on them and questioning why they have such strong faith. And you know, the left doesn't care. The left seems to think that we're all a bunch of superstitious old goats and that they're just going to either wait for us to die off or they're going to lock us away somewhere and we won't interfere with their, uh, their grand strategy to uh, turn this into a uh, socialist republic, their view of uh, what you'd call Valhalla, a heaven for them would be a walking around everybody living in the same tiny cramped apartment in a high rise made of cinder blocks and everybody going down and standing in line for three hours to get toilet paper made out of emery cloth. Just like they did in the old Soviet Union. That's what they, they'd really, I think, like to see for us. And when we, we say, that, look, American liberalism has been completely influenced by Marxists for the last 50 years. And somebody pointed out something I saw on one of the blogs I was reading last night. If you think that the president is, uh, is not actually patriotic, here's the thing. If Mr. Obama was given a choice and he, had, and he had no other choices but one or the other, if someone told him you can have a free market economy or a state-controlled economy, which one do you think he would choose? Doesn't that answer the question? Doesn't that back up what Rudolph Giuliani said? 845, Bill Colley with you this morning. 39 at our studios on Top Story. 1310, KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com online. You can reach our program by calling 736-0300. So Scott Walker, who has three times been elected governor, and they tried to take him out in a recall election, you may, may remember a few years ago. Three times in about five years he's been elected governor in his uh, home state of Wisconsin. He is the son of a Baptist minister. He may, stress may, be running for president. Right now, in all the polls, he leads the Republican field. That's because, of course, he stood up to the unions that were bankrupting his state. This is from Alex Griswold with The Daily Caller. Reporter mocks Scott Walker for claiming to communicate with God through prayer. Here you go again. This is, this is going to be apparently, the fact that the, the country is trillions of dollars in debt doesn't matter to these people. You know, as long as you come over to their house and engage with them in a little same sex and, uh, and you know, eat all of the right to vegetables and fruits and skip meat and, uh, and don't believe in God and tear down any ornaments you may see hanging around town at Christmas, you're going to be all right with them, you understand. Alex Griswold, the reporter, political wire publisher, and this guy must have been in the back of the line when they were handing out first names, Tegan Goddard. Caught a lot of flack on Twitter after mocking Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker for claiming he could discern God's will only to admit that he had no idea that Christians believed they could communicate with God through prayer. It all began with a rather snarky tweet about Walker's comments that he was still waiting for God's calling, 
before he announced a presidential run. And then this guy just simply tore into him as being, you know, out in la-la land. He was treating Walker as if Walker believed in some sort of fiction and that he was, uh, he was uh, communicating directly with God. I was accused of that in my last job because lefty doesn't understand that we do pray and we wait for answers that way. We wait for signs in our lives if you, if you are a believer. This guy then went so far after he got, he got flooded with emails and tweets responding to him. And not, a, not all of them very, very nice. Not that that bothers me. I think somebody should give him a good swift kick right in his pants. Backside, not front. I wouldn't go that far. But then he said he didn't know that Christians believed that they could communicate with God through prayer. How could he not know that? Is, is he playing dumb, or is he simply that stupid? And is he indicative of most liberals that you meet in, in establishment media in this day and age? Is he indicative of that guy, is it John Alexander at the Times News, who's leaving town because simply he doesn't fit in? You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's an oddball uh, square peg trying to fit into a round hole here. Is he indicative of those people who, who work at the major news networks? Is he indicative of academia and Hollywood who, who, who look down their nose at you if you go to church and if you do more than put up a Christmas tree? See, they do that and they claim they're Christians. Some guy called me on a radio show one time and he said, I think we need to follow Jesus' teachings. Because he, 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 was, uh, he was not happy with the direction the show happened to be going. And I said, well, what would those be? And then there was dead silence. <laughs> well... Somebody told him somewhere along the line, Jesus said to be nice to everybody and that I'm okay, you're okay. That's 1960s pap. It's baloney. It's, 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 it's just simply a, it, it, it's the way to fool a lot of people into thinking they're following that path. There was a, a great preacher by the name of Lon Solomon, and I used to work at a radio station where we carried his program. Lon Solomon is a guy, raised Jewish, was not very faithful. He may have believed in God, but he wasn't what you'd call a type of individual who spent a lot of time sweating it. And he was, he was training to be a chemist. And I think this was at Duke University in North Carolina. And he was training to be a chemist. And what he ended up doing was one day walking down a street and he ran into a street preacher. And the two got to talking. A couple of days later, he ran into the same guy. And this continued over and over and over again. And finally, Solomon said, I'd like to know what this guy is talking about a bit more. So he got himself a Bible and he read the thing, and it was a tremendous revelation to him. Solomon, even though he's now the pastor of a megachurch in northern Virginia, Solomon still claims that he's, he believes himself to be a Jew, even though he spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I heard Solomon on his show one morning, and you can listen to it online too as well, because he's a wonderful storyteller. He was working out at a gym, and he said most of the time, everybody at the gym avoids him because, well, he's the preacher. In other words, people, are, they get nervous about this. They don't want to go over, they, well, he'll just judge me if I walk over there, and I don't want to hear about religion. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to watch uh, a couple of shows on uh, reality TV, and uh, don't, don't bother me, leave me alone. So this fellow walks up to him suddenly while he's working on the bicycle, Guy walks up to him and says, I need to talk to you. I'd like to come to your church. Solomon says, why? The guy says, I need a little religion in my life. Solomon says, we don't do religion. What do you mean you don't do religion? You've got the great big church out there in McLean, Virginia. Solomon said, we do personal relationships with Christ. What are you talking about? The guy said. Solomon said, well, let's, let's start giving you a little bit of background. Solomon's pedaling away on the bike and he's explaining all of this to this guy and suddenly the guy draws back and says, why? That sounds exclusionary. And then the guy stormed off, never came to the church because apparently, you know, he believed that if he just got a little religion, whatever that would be, he wasn't sure what it was, but he, he figured that all religions were the same. It's like for liberals, you go into the store, it doesn't matter if it's a Maxwell House, Sue Ban, or, or the store brand, or Folgers. Whatever's on sale, right? They think that religion works the same way. They have no clue, and they don't know why. You know, uh, when he said, I am the way, from a Christian perspective, that pretty well sums it all up, but they can't grasp that. So Scott Walker is going to be putting up with more of this. It's not an 
ending right now. You saw it happen a few years ago, well, with Mitt Romney as well because of his strong beliefs. You saw it happen, uh, his closest rival in the Republican Party, Rick Santorum, he got that sort of grief. If Jindal gets in, he'll be getting it this, uh, this, this time around. And, of course, if Mike Huckabee, he's got a target on his back already, uh, bigger than some states because of what he believes in. He's actually a clergyman, so he's going to be fighting this battle as well. We have truly gotten to that point where evil is out in the open, and it is battling us for the soul of this country. A couple of other things. When we're talking about the direction the country is going, if you think of this, and I'm not trying to get into some end times prophecy here today whatsoever, but if you think about it, what's playing out around the world? The other day I was reading that it looks as if Libya, the entire country, is going to fall to ISIS. If that happens, ISIS will then be able to shell ships out in the Mediterranean, including American naval ships and American uh, ships that are just transporting goods, or Chinese ships that are transport anybody's ships. They will have the big beachfront, and it's a big, long beachfront in Libya. They will have the ability, and they're not far away from Sicily, they will have the ability to start firing rockets in that direction. Do you not see what this could mean to people? So if you're talking about, and they believe in the end times, if you're talking about all of this, we, we, are, we are in a battle right now, not just for the soul of the country, but really for the world. And we've got people who are in charge who just don't have the stomach to fight it. It's 854. Call it 39. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We have a caller with us. Caller, you're welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Good morning. Yes, sir. What's on your mind? Okay. Well, the, uh, you're talking about the, the spread between good and evil. And the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the video off of YouTube, but it's last year when Texas was redoing its uh, abortion law, there was a pro-life group. They were outside the, the Capitol in Austin. There was a pro-life group that was singing uh, Amazing Grace, and they were surrounded by a pro-choice group that was chanting Hail Satan. I saw that. Yeah, that was up. Yeah. Uh... Of course, that cost that woman her attempt to win the governorship in Texas. Yeah, yeah, and that's in that period. And so it's just a, well, it's a little snapshot, but it's definitely that division is getting stark, really sharp. They are so much out in the open about it. That is yeah. what surprises me is that you have people who, at least they used to try to hide it, and they used to try to, you Not know, anymore. It's just yeah. right out there. Um, on the, the comment on the... The ISIS thing, you know, we we are, and I believe this president and his administration, the people he surrounded himself with, are using ISIS as a push for to bring up an old communist term, world revolution. We destabilize, we take help, we put in arms to help take out Gaddafi, who wasn't a good guy. That destabilizes Libya. We, uh, you know, Egypt. Uh, we pull out of Iraq. That destabilizes that. Uh, we, 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 the only, the only revolution we did support in the Middle East was a brief uprising in Iran. The, uh, that was actual freedom based and not by a, driven yeah. by a bunch of uh, Islamic militants. We've we've got to wrap up in just a minute, but just to follow up on that, I just saw a video this morning from a retired admiral who says that way back in 1987, there had been plans to take out Iran's government, and we should have done it at the time. And unfortunately, some people in Washington got some cold feet. And, and here you go again. We're seeing a repeat of that in our own capital in Washington from people in similar types of roles. I, th I thank him for the call. One last thing this segment of the program. We've got about a minute before I have to wrap up, and I, was, I wanted to get to this quickly. I'm not sure that in, in Revelation that I, I don't know how you interpret this mark of the beast, but... Some people might say, I have a driver's license, and when I got it issued in the state where I was living at the time, I refused to go ahead with the federally compliant driver's license. And because of that, I don't have a gold star on it. I have, in fact, a license that says, not for federal identification. Think about that for a moment. AP Wire reporting today, Idaho is a step closer to asking the federal government for more time to start complying with the Federal Real ID Act the Senate Transportation Committee endorsed a bill Tuesday that would let the state transportation department ask the federal go ask that is the federal government to postpone the compliance deadline for one year. Without it, Idaho residents won't be able to use their Idaho driver's licenses to board commercial flights starting in 2016. So we are going to start stratifying people, and and if you don't have this federally compliant license, 
Remember, the legislature banned the state from complying in 2008. What's happened since then? Well, here we go again. Republicans backing down, uh, just like we see them do in Washington on amnesty and a number of these other issues, backing down on this one. Because you know what would happen is your constituents would say, I couldn't fly to Miami to visit my aunt. So, so this is what we're dealing with. This is, this is the United States of America. We have a constitution that says you have God-given rights, that these can't be taken away by anybody else. Liberty means you can move around anywhere you, you want to go, and yet, where is your federally compliant license? Mine doesn't have that star on it. For that very, someone said, well, you won't be able to go into a federal building. Good. Next time they call me for jury duty, I'll have to say, sorry, I'm in the underclass. You, you don't want me. 8.58. News is coming up next. Fox Radio, in fact, news. Also, in the next half hour, I believe we have Suzanne Hawkins joining us from the Twin Falls City Council. Hope you can stick around. A couple of things we'll be talking about related to uh, the city, perhaps, facing uh, a loss of some revenue being siphoned away by the state and what that could mean for people who live here and really any city in, in Idaho. That on the way. You're listening to Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com online anywhere around the world. As I was mentioning, we have a guest who will be joining us in studio for a few minutes today, and we'll be talking about some issues related to what's going on in the city of Twin Falls. But really, as I said just before 9 o'clock news, could affect cities across the state, and, and you're talking a great many communities. Uh, and, and oddly enough, when Suzanne Hawkins came walking in from the Twin Falls City Council, she pointed out that she has spent some time working with the, uh, do you call it the Association of Cities? Association of Idaho Cities. There you go. So it, to be even more precise, we need to point out, of course, that we'd like to say welcome, first of all. Thank you very much. I'm first, glad to be here. First time I've had you in the studio. Yes. And I, I think Don told you that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty decent to get along with. <laughs> yes, I've heard nothing but good. <laughs> all right, no, super. Thank you. Thank you. 907, call it 41 at our studios this morning, News Radio 1310 KLIX. Also online anywhere around the world, newsradio1310.com. And I hope you can stick around for our conversation because uh, this is really where, when we get down to the local issues, where you, as a, as a person sitting here with us today, probably have the greatest amount of say in, or input in what's going on. Uh, right off the top, there was a presentation made at the meeting this week by the city manager, and you've been aware of this through that other role with the, with the association that this could be happening soon. But we could see a huge drop in revenue, or at least the state would take more money that would normally be spent here on personnel and the like. Well, what, what's happening is part of our budget, we were allowed to collect taxes on new construction. And the new construction money is not only for the city, it's also for the county, it's for the highway district, the school district. All taxing entities get a portion of that. And what the state's proposing is taking half away from the cities, the counties, the highway district and moving that to the schools, which sounds like it could be a good deal for the schools, but right now we're also facing a lot of transportation needs in the community. And so they're gonna take money away from those roads that we're so desperately trying to fix and give it to the schools when all said, it's not enough money to fix the school problems and it could actually create more of an illusion that the schools are getting money to fix their problems and, and they're really not. And it, it's really splitting hairs and it's just not good to change the formula we've been working off of. Well, you know, I know that as a newcomer in the last couple of months, you drive through downtown, it all looks very clean. Uh, you drive out into the new end of town, if you call it that, uh, mm -hmm. on the north side. Uh, it, it all looks clean and, and, and gleaming and, and people are moving here from other places because of relatively low taxes. I mean, some of the best probably in the country if you're, a, if you're an actual taxpayer. But when you're driving up and down some of the streets, for instance, you'll notice that where there's a quick dip as you cross the street and it's a little bit rough on the, you know, on the vehicle as you're doing all of that. And in that one area probably is the area that really needs to be addressed the most, I would think. Well, right now, ev everywhere across the state is fighting for dollars to fix their roadways. This, everybody knows that our transportation system needs money, our bridges. We have bridges now that um, can only have one-way traffic, not because they're not wide enough, but because they can't handle the weight any longer. 
Um, so this is a this is a taxing issue that's going to affect, as you said, everyone across the state. And then you look at smaller communities that don't collect a lot from new construction. You know, in Twin Falls, we've been very blessed recently with a, a lot of industry moving in. So that has helped um, us actually keep the citizens' city taxes lower mm -hmm. because we can use that money instead of raising taxes. But in some of the smaller communities, there is no new construction, and so their schools are actually going to suffer because the, according to the state's formula, they should be getting more money than what they're actually going to be receiving. And it could be a deficit to them. So on the whole picture, it would really be a negative to the state, to schools and transportation and the city all the way around. In fact, I think it was put into a pretty stark uh, example by the city manager when he said, you're looking at two and a half positions, perhaps at a police department or a correct. fire department if this happens. That is correct. That would it, That's what it would be to our budget. Last year, the city of Twin Falls was able to only... Um, by state statute, we can take a 3% tax increase every year. And in Twin Falls, we um, historically do not do that. We fight to keep the taxes low here. So because our new construction's been a little bit higher, we were able to only raise taxes, I think it was like by 0.78%. But in the overall picture, when you looked at all the averages, actually what you paid dropped last year for the city's portion. Of course, the bond passed for the school, so the school portion went up which kind of offset, but you know, we're doing our best to keep our portion of it as low as we can. And taking that new construction money could really affect how we align our budget next year. I know for years, I used to talk to people in state government who would tell me over in Washington, they set, they, they pass a law, but then they mandate we have to pay for it or the expenses, or we have, to, we have to do the regulations. So in other words, we look like the bad guy sometimes. We're playing the role of the heavy. And then I meet people at county and city governments, town governments too, and they say to me, well, the state went ahead and did this, and then the state said, but you've got to do this. Right. And so it, it really, it, it just, the, it, the bigger governments end up doing this to the smaller governments, and in the long run, people will say to all of you, gee, why did you do this when re reality is it happened at Boise? I think they forget that we are the working hands. We are required to provide services. We have to keep our streets functional. We have to keep our police in force. We have to make sure you have water and sewer. And I mean, there, there is no option. So if they're cutting our funding and how we are paying for that, we have to, you know, we have to be able to make up for that. And in the long run, the taxpayers who pays for it. I think it's important for people to be aware of what's happening in Boise. Um, this particular one is House Bill 173. And talk to your state leaders. You know, we're asking them, do no harm. That, that's all we want. There's a number of bills this year that are affecting the city. So we're watching, oh, eight or 10 different things moving right now. And, uh, and for people who, who, you know, you may see one of those state legislators around town, Mention it to them if you see them at the grocery store or on the street somewhere. Definitely. And their emails really, you know, it's easy to access. Just send them a line and say, you know, I understand that our schools need money, but we don't feel that, you know, this is a fair way to do it because even though you might be getting an extra $200,000 to the Twin Falls School District off this formula, the city's going to have to make up for it. So actually it could cause their taxes to go up in the long run. Our guest is Suzanne Hawkins joining us from the Twin Falls City Council and 41 at 914. You're listening to Bill Colley on Top Story at News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio 1310.com. And of course, uh, during this half hour, you can also uh, perhaps talk directly to your council person by dialing us up at 736-0300. That's politically correct. Councilwoman's probably fine, right? That is perfect. Okay. I'm good. 736. <laughs> Somebody out there is probably taking notes. 736-0300 well, would be the number to reach us. One other thing. I, I had planned to be there, but I had a conflict last Thursday night. There was a meeting about downtown. Uh, I didn't get over to the ballroom to attend it, but you were seeking some public input on what Main Street revitalization will look like. That is correct. And can I tell you, I think it is the single largest attended event I have ever seen since I've been involved with City Council. Really? I was I was blown away with the public support of what's happening downtown. Um, we also have a City Youth Council, and they attended that meeting in force. So we had, um, I think, just about every generation of age covered there and ideas, and it was a fantastic meeting. We have a caller looking to join us. Uh, you're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX with Suzanne Hawkins. What's on your mind? Good morning. You were just talking about our state representatives, seeing them around town. Um, I see one of them regularly, and it's Lance Clow, and he always has time to talk to the issues. He always has time, and if he doesn't have the answer right now, 
he'll find it and get right back to you. So uh, what you and Suzanne were just talking about is absolutely true. And the same thing with our city council members. Uh, they are very accessible. So I just wanted to put my input in on that story. Well, you know, a lot of these people got into state politics because they started locally, too, as well. That is correct. And I uh, want to thank him for the telephone call. Are we looking, you know, I drive down Main Street right now, and at least through the downtown area, the traditional downtown area, with the trees and all. When I was first moving here, I actually pulled up Google and looked at the photographs, and they were all from that stretch because of the trees, and it, it has that look, that very... Almost up. You, you could you could almost think it was think it was Sun Valley or somewhere, right? Because of the the look of it, it's got that boutique style up and down the streets. Will that remain, or will that be expanded? What what's the actual plan? Okay, first of all, I want to make sure everybody understands that the Urban Renewal Agency is the one that is the driving force behind this. And so, as the city, we're stepping upside our partner, but this is not our game changer right now. So just so you understand that the Urban Renewal Agency is controlling this, they have uh, money in that TIF district to do some improvements, and definitely the water and sewer lines are the first thing on that list. There's a great wish list of all these other things we'd like to see done, but until we get the final estimates on the cost of the water in the sewer, everything else will be secondary. We, had, we assume from what we've looked at at this point that there will be enough for, you know, the paving, the sidewalks, um, new trees. It, there's been a couple of different drawings of what it's going to look like. And yes, it's going to keep a very hometown feel to it, but there's going to be some new amenities to add to the downtown as well. Of course, you mentioned uh, water, sewer, and probably electricity. If you're looking for someone to move into that area with a business, those are three things they're going to ask about right away. Correct. And right now, you know, um, we just, we don't, the water lines and sewer lines are from the original city. And so they are old and they are definitely needing to be replaced. And that's going to help with water pressure. And then once we can meet water pressure fire codes, then we can start opening up the upstairs on those buildings again. So it's going to open up a lot of opportunity for the business owners. It's going to be a little more expensive, but we've agreed to keep all of that in the alleyways instead of moving them to Main Street, just to save the business owners from having to pay the cost of reconnecting. And the character of that area too. I mean, in, on, in the front doors, obviously, you don't really want to change that because it, it's very pretty to walk through there with the big pines and all of that. Correct. But some of those trees are going to have to go because they are ruining the sidewalks and the street. And we are going to go with smarter trees now that we've learned. Those trees were put in, I believe, 50 years ago. So there, there will be a lot of updating to that. Some of these other trees grow very fast, though, from my experience. You put them in. And, Correct. But and, we're looking at trees that won't have the root systems that are going to cause the problems in the crack in the sidewalks like we have now. Knew that growing up as a kid, walking down <laughs> streets, and all of a sudden you knew. If you walked the certain streets to school, you knew every spot where the sidewalk heaved about five, six inches because of the root systems that were growing there. Exactly. Real quick, two things they're talking about that I was excited about. is They're called festival streets. So it kind of levels out the sidewalk and the curbing so you have um, more of an open feel for large gatherings and then you put in some calming traffic devices to help with that. And the other thing we're looking at is back-in parking, um, back-in angled parking, which is going to be a new concept for us, but something we're really excited to see how it flows. Nearsighted drivers like me are going to need a re re rehabilitation course. <laughs> I, we said we might set up a practice area somewhere. <laughs> you can spend a few more minutes with us, you right? Bet. Because I know that perhaps we might have a couple of other telephone calls on the uh, other side of this break and uh, they may have a question or two. And there's just a few other things with the change in seasons, some things that are coming up that aren't necessarily worry, worrisome about, you know, crime, taxes, sewage, whatever. But we're getting to a period of time where a lot of neat outdoor things are going to be happening around the city. Correct. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, too, as well. Uh, we've already had our spring, it seems. Things have cooled off just a little <laughs> bit. It's 30, no, 41 now. We're looking at 41 at our studios at 919. We've got more with Suzanne Hawkins coming up from the Twin Falls City Council. This is News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. The show is Top Story with Bill Colley. Suzanne Hawkins has agreed to stick around for a few more minutes with us on Top Story coming up on 924. We've got about five more minutes uh, during her visit. And if you'd like to reach the member of the Twin Falls City Council, you can give us a call at News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com, the number being 736 0300. Bill Colley, I'm the host of Top Story. 
right now 41, 924 at our studios. Uh, we, we talk a little bit uh, about some of the serious issues, but we do have, uh, somebody already told me, and I'm not living very far away from uh, uh, the big shell downtown, that in the summertime, that's a great place to be because of all the activities going on there. That is true. We love our city park and we love our city band, and it's coming up on time where they're going to start their weekly summer concert series again. And uh, and we, we've we had a bit of a taste of the warm weather already for a few weeks, uh, but uh, it's a good way for people just to, you know, I'll tell you what, if, you, if you're looking for a way, a healthy way, to sort of get out and relax a little bit, this is probably one of those perfect things to do. It is. It's a good thing. This time of year is exciting with all the things. Um, one of my other jobs is I work with the City Youth Council, and coming up in April, they have their annual Kite Days, which is a way to celebrate alternative energy and our wonderful spring wind here. And that's going to be at Vista Bonita Park this year. So be watching for that. Um, we are right now replacing the stairs around Durkee's Lake. So this summer that will be open and that's a great area to go down and walk and get some fresh air as well. Um, thanks to First Federal's generous donation to the city, we're well underway on our new Splash Park and um, all accessible park that'll be opening up the end of May. So lots of fun, good things getting ready to happen. And that, uh, that changed with the steps at the lake. Uh, you've gone from uh, the traditional wood that doesn't last as long to a much sturdier uh, uh, what metal this time around, right? Correct, yes. And I think some of the walkways being replaced as well. Um, you know, we had so much in our budget, and we're getting as much of it knocked out as we can do. Uh, jumping back to a more serious issue you pointed out during the, the break, there are 11 bills currently and may, may not all oh, become they're not, laws. They're not bills yet, but they're all things that are being discussed and getting ready to be introduced. But they all they have could not, be introduced. Yes, but they have not all received bill numbers yet. That could impact city governance. Correct. And and this is one more reason to talk, I guess, to those state legislators. Even if you support some of what they're doing, you know, you should really be informed. And Because so many mm -hmm. times I think laws get passed and people go, how did that happen? I, I believe that is that is. True. It is hard to watch everything. And, you know, it's just like on city government, we're required to notice and post and and let people know two weeks in advance of what we're doing. So we, we have lots of ways of getting the word out and letting people know. At the state, they can introduce a bill in the morning and have a hearing that afternoon or the next day. They don't have the time constraints. So if you're not active and watching, it's hard to keep track of everything happening. And we have a caller joining us. You're on the air. It's 927 on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And what's on your mind? Yes, thanks for having my call. I, I wanted to uh, make Susanna Waring, if she wasn't already, that uh, that splash park um, will end up taking up soccer um, fields, at least two of them, probably the best two fields that there are out there. It sounds like are the ones that they have slated to take up that space. And I have three girls that play soccer, and so they depend heavily on on those fields and also those fields are completely utilized for a um, soccer tournament that happens every year which brings in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to the city um, got about a minute and a half to go uh, quickly I'll ask quick. you we are aware of that and we're in negotiations with the neighbor right now and we are at acquiring the property next to that park to add those soccer fields back in. So so in other words, it's a win-win situation you're looking I at. I think so, yes. All right. want to thank him very much for the telephone call. One reason I think people don't get as much detail any longer about what's going on in government, those of us on the media side, there are a lot fewer of us. So you don't have the newspaper staffs, the television staffs, the radio news staffs that my first radio or third radio newsroom, we had 24 people in it. So uh, times have changed, obviously, mm -hmm. and and so trying to get information isn't always easy, even for some of you in government, because unless you're talking directly to a, a contact in Boise, you don't have that availability. That is correct. Um, you know, you can watch the state's website. They post daily what the hearings are going to be. The city has a website where we post everything that we're working on. We try our best to keep that information flowing, but it, it's a constant battle. I was going to say... Uh, those young people in that youth council are, are going to have a interesting time when they kind of move on in a few years and move into those larger roles because we've seen so many dramatic changes in, in just the 25 years I've been in media. Government has to deal with all of those too, and, and government deals with that rapid change as best as it can, but it's like the IRS using a computer system 50 years old. Sometimes right. you, you, you're playing catch-up more than you really like to just because things change so rapidly in this world anymore. 
Yeah, you really have to keep up with it. Um, you know, I think with social media and stuff, that younger generation is better geared for it than we are. <laughs> yes, they, they. my daughter had a mouse in her hands when she was about old enough to get that motor control going. And, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and I was probably 35. So. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd like to thank you for coming by today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. This and has been it, great. It, hopefully you won't see as much train traffic on the way out. I hope so. Let's hope we can get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Suzanne Hawkins joining us in studio this morning from the Twin Falls City Council. 42 right now at our studios. It's 930. Bill Colley with you. One more half hour ahead still on the show today. And hey, I've got a couple of quick things here. Uh, health story on e-cigarettes and on whether we should be uh, in the workplace so opposed to those because some health is uh, well some doctors are saying perhaps it's a better alternative than letting someone actually sit down and smoke a cigarette or a cigar details ahead on talk radio news radio 1310 klix and news radio 1310.com We wanted to point out with about half an hour to go on the program today, you can give us a telephone call. And that telephone number, 736-0300. That's 736-0300. And you can, uh, you can question or comment about anything that we have talked about already today. It's 42 at our studios. Bill Colley with you, 934 on Top Story. I had mentioned uh, this, uh, this piece. Do you know that most workplaces today, it didn't take long for this to happen. Most workplaces today have a rule in place you know, we've gone smoke-free 20-some years. I think the, in my memory, I was working in a building in 1989, and they had a smoking room that they had just installed. And we moved into a new building that same year where I was working, and we had a smoking room. And that lasted about five years, and then they eliminated it altogether and said, no smoking whatsoever on the grounds. So what you did is you would go by the, uh, outside the building, and you, was, you would always see the group of people out there socializing over their cigarettes, and they all had to move outside no matter what the weather was. And now we have this thing called vaping, and we have e-cigarettes, and people are being told, don't light those up. Well, light up is probably not quite the right term to use, but don't do those while you're in the workplace. You'll, you'll bother or disturb some other people. I worked with a man who used to actually come in, and he was doing that vaping thing, which is nothing but a little water vapor going into the air, and he would come in for his shift at a radio station, and he would walk into the broadcast booth because it would be empty while we were running a syndicated show. So he would walk into the broadcast booth and do all of his show preparation in there all alone with the door closed and use his vapor thing. And finally, someone said, you can't do that here any longer. And these new rules came into effect so very, very quickly. There is a fellow writing at the Wall Street Journal today who says we're making a big Big mistake. Oh, he's a doctor, too. I should point that out. What he is saying is there are people who argue, well, we don't want vaping. We don't want e-cigarettes because if we do this, we're setting a bad example for young people because this will be a gateway to smoking cigarettes. He said that has been the big argument that we have seen that people have been making about all of this. His name is Michael B. Siegel, and it's on the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal today, the headline being The Misbegotten Crusade against e-cigarettes. Now, I, I'm not criticizing any workplace that has decided to ban these, but I'm pointing out perhaps they move too quickly. And some of the things, of course, you can go vape outside too if you like. That's certainly not, not an issue. But he says, many in the anti-smoking movement are conducting a misleading campaign against products like these, and this campaign may be doing harm to the public. The most common claim about e-cigarettes is that they are a gateway to smoking. He said these statements had no basis in fact when they were made, and the evidence is that they do not act as a gateway. Electronic cigarettes might even be a deterrent to tobacco addiction. So he's saying we have an opportunity to reduce people's addiction to tobacco and have maybe have a healthier alternative, if not a healthy alternative. And he said, are they safe? Of course not, but e-cigarettes don't need to be absolutely safe. By definition, harm reduction involves an alternative product that is much safer. We have, uh, this is all part of the growing political correctness in this country. I was reading a book by Charles Murray. He's the man who came up with a book in the 1990s called The Bell Curve. Liberals hated him, but his, his research was spot on. He came out with a book called, I think it was Breaking Apart or Growing Apart a few years ago. I managed to get a copy of that book, and I read that book. And he pointed out that the elites in this country 
don't like smokers, don't like people who are fat, don't like people who don't go out and go running every morning. So because of that, you are somehow considered subhuman when you are being compared to them by them. And I think we're seeing a great deal of this when it comes to e-cigarettes. Their attitude is, you shouldn't have been smoking in the first place. You shouldn't have become a tobacco addict. They, they have all of this sympathy for all of these other protected groups, minorities and the like, that they, they call victims. But when it comes to someone who started smoking at 15 and would perhaps like to stop by doing the vaping or the e-cigarettes so they can ramp it down slowly, they have no patience or tolerance for you. But they all want tolerance for whatever screwball ideas they have. I need to point out today, we, we tell you once in a while about a great job opportunity. If you are someone who has retired and gotten bored in retirement or looking for a little extra money in retirement, or you are somebody who is looking for a perhaps a little additional income around your home, Western States Bus Services is hiring part-time bus drivers right now, split shifts five days per week, summers off, and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. Apply today, and the number to contact, 733-8003. That is 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. Wanted to share that with you. The political correctness, there is a great piece in the Daily Beast, which is a rather liberal publication, to put it mildly, where one of the writers there says, Modern media, that is, the mainstream media, or establishment media, if you prefer, has decided to adopt the language of the politically correct, whether they did knowingly or not, and that that's a huge problem. Details on that, perhaps, coming up in just a few minutes. Bill Colley with you on Top Story 42 at 940 on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. The Huckabee Report is coming up in a few minutes. Uh, we'll have uh, Mike Huckabee for about uh, four minutes at 9.50 this morning, sharing with us uh, some pearls of wisdom. You're listening to Bill Colley on Top Story. It's 9.44. News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com online, meaning you can hear us anywhere around the world. 42 at our studios. Another Sunday start to our day. Happen to come across something. I just referenced political correctness, and I'm going to tell you right now, there is an effort, I, I said in media, it is permeating media, but there's an effort in media as well. <sighs> Brian Williams is not the only bald-faced liar in media. Let's get right to the point. This was in the opinion page yesterday of the New York Times, the Bible of American liberalism. And you have this headline that says, when whites get a free pass. Subheadline reads, research shows white privilege is real. You know, I've noticed that too. When I'm driving down the highway and I'm, you know, 30 miles over the speed limit and I pass a trooper who's running radar and he sees that I'm a white guy, even though I'm flying by at breakneck speed, he just kind of nods, smiles and waves and lets me go. Yeah, you notice it's happening in your life too. You go into a bank and you walk in and you tell them, I want some money. And if you're white, they just like Eddie Murphy on that sketch the other night on the Saturday Night Live, you know, they throw money at you, don't they? Because you know exactly how this works because... You're a white guy. You know as well that if you go out in the middle of the night and start screaming up and down in your neighborhood about uh, something that you don't like or some marital issues, uh, the police might come by. If they see you're white, they go, understood. See you later. You know that if you're white and you're standing out on a street corner dealing crack cocaine, the cops just drive by and say, hey, be careful. It's kind of dangerous around here. Happens all the time now, doesn't it? So I saw this headline and I saw the sub headline. I thought, ah. So now they have evidence that people like me have been getting away with things that other people haven't been getting away with. When I'm naughty, it's okay. When those minorities are naughty, they go to prison. And then I started reading the thing. I got to paragraph two. A field experiment about who gets free bus rides in Brisbane, a city on the eastern coast of Australia, shows that even today whites get special privileges. And I thought, well, okay, but have they been doing any research in the United States? Flip the page, and no. Uh, no, don't see anything there. How about another page? There's a third page here. Anything here about the United States of America? No. Uh, hmm. The writer is a guy named Ian Ayers, kind of like Bill Ayers, you know, the, the former terrorist. 
Ian Ayers, and he is a professor at Yale University. So uh, I, I took a look at that, and I thought, it sounds as if they finally have evidence that I've been getting away with all sorts of cool things that nobody else can get away with because being Caucasian, you know, I, I have the, that special privilege. But it's not about the USA at all. So why are you publishing this, making it sound as if one size fits all? I don't know much about Australia. Brisbane, uh, I had an uncle who was stationed there in World War II, sadly was killed. And for some strange reason, he was with the Fifth Air Force. He is not listed on the roster of dead. I wrote the museum uh, that, that they have set up to the, uh, to the memory of these men and asked a couple of years ago why there was no mention of him, and I didn't get an answer back. So the Australians apparently are terribly disorganized. We can say that right away. But I, I'm looking through this, and I was thinking to myself, Show me some evidence that this is actually happening in America. And they, there's no mention of it. There's nothing. But, you know, if you just looked at that headline, and I'm sure a lot of liberals in a hurry yesterday with their New York Times subscriptions on their way down to Starbucks took a quick gander and said, yep, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, that's what we've always told people. Let's go uh, flagellate ourselves for having privilege. And there you go. Uh, so wouldn't it be said it's a little disingenuous on the part of the New York Times, the Bible of American liberalism, to try to say that Americans are just like Australians in this case, because somebody in Brisbane, Australia, apparently got a bus fare that was reduced because they happened to be Caucasian. Yeah, uh, it's all grown out of that one example. Do, do you think that perhaps the American left is trying to, well, let me put it this way. Their view is it doesn't matter if it's really true or not. The ends justify the means for lefty, don't they? So if you have an opportunity to try and, and you know, your narrative, you, you, have, you have an opportunity to promote it, it doesn't matter that it's not true. You're going to go ahead and you're going to do it anyway. And then you're going to try to double down and tell people, well, <laughs> or they shout at you. You notice that happens occasionally. It doesn't happen too often anymore. When I first arrived here, I got all of these calls from these lefties, and they would start shouting at you, thinking if I shout the loudest, that means I've made my point. And yet, of course, they didn't, but that's, that's how they look at it. And amongst themselves, I guess there's some pride in that. Speaking of privilege, maybe they get some privilege out of that because if I went around shouting everybody down all the time, they would say, ah, you conservatives, we've been telling people what a bunch of knuckle-dragging Neanderthals you are, and now you've proven it. It's like that kid who comes up to you on the playground and he spits in your face. So you haul off and you deck him and he goes sailing through the mud, three or four feet. And he gets up caked in mud and he runs over to the playground monitor and says, that guy's being mean to me. Yeah, well, don't go spitting in people's faces. Huckabee is coming up in just a moment. Should point out that the Huckabee Report is brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736 6563. Want to thank Governor Huckabee very much for his uh, time as usual this morning. And you can hear Mike Huckabee Monday through Fridays, very same time, right here on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Bill Colley with you this morning for just a couple of more minutes. And then following Fox News at 10 o'clock, it's Rush Limbaugh for three hours. Following the news at 1 o'clock, Sean Hannity. And then following the news at 4 o'clock, Glenn Beck, all ahead here on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Saw something as well related to what I was just talking about how media is trying or working in collusion with people on the American left to try and change the way you think and believe about the world. Uh, that you will adopt their worldview, whether or not it has ever been yours. There is a young woman by the name of Kelly Goff. She is writing at a very liberal publication called The Daily Beast. She says PC culture is taking over newsrooms. Increasingly, she says advocacy groups are pressuring journalists and news outlets to adopt their language or else. In other words, if you don't, there was a newspaper in California just a couple of weeks ago that got vandalized. Uh, the office was vandalized because they used the words illegal immigrants in the news copy. And the people there were angry that they were not using undocumented. So they attacked this private business, this newspaper, for not going along with the, the Orwellian change in language. She writes, the Columbia Journalism Review credited immigration advocacy groups 
with playing a key role in the AP's decision to stop using the term illegal immigrant and called the move a victory for such organizations. The AP denied that outside pressure had any impact, but that is hard to believe since eradicating the term has been a key messaging priority of immigrant rights organizations. Most advocates in support of same-sex marriage insist on using the term marriage equality in media. It's something she says I have always found odd. When many also compare the legal battles over same-sex marriage to the legal battles over interracial marriage, which was never historically referred to as marriage equality. She goes on to say assisted suicide. The use of the word assisted suicide. She said, you know, if you use the word suicide, that the actual public support for assisted suicide goes down. So some liberals are now trying to use something else, pressuring newspapers and also TV and radio media and folks on the Internet to drop the word suicide because it's a better way to sell the idea to the public. The public recoils at the word suicide, but they don't recoil otherwise. See, isn't it strange how we're dealing with all of this and these people claim that they are a free press and that they are not biased? We have time very quickly for one last telephone caller. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, on the Drudge Report uh, this morning, uh, he linked to the latest... uh, way that Obama's trying to defend his unconstitutional amnesty. And the headline of, of uh, Obama's document called uh, Illegal Immigrants, Americans in Waiting. Isn't it amazing? And, and you know what? Establishment media will go right along with that. I thank you so much for the telephone call. The New York Times has dropped the word homosexual from its copy. Maureen Dowd, who was a longtime columnist there, about 70 years old, never married. You do the math. Uh, Maureen Dowd said a couple of years ago, she she led the charge for it, saying that homosexual was a mean-spirited term. And so they've now used gay, which used to mean just happy. Now, I'm not passing any judgment on anyone when I make that comment. I'm just telling you, it shows you how they've decided they would like to change the debate on on all of this in this country by changing the language on it but they would if if i was involved with a relationship with a woman they would say i'm a heterosexual i wouldn't take offense i'm not i'm not campaigning to be called happy hi i'm happy my neighbor over here is gay i'm happy and you know being happy i find is politically incorrect but let me tell you something about how much pleasure i find in being happy You think that they would turn around and call me happy if I asked them to call me happy in the paper? Nah. (laughs) How about being called a progressive when there's nothing progressive about what they stand for? Some editor at the Washington Post one time said to me, well, that's what they want to be called. All right. You wouldn't call me something nice.